good morning. I know some of you are busting to get home to watch the replay. It was a joke. <laughs> it's bigger things in life than rugby, people. I learned that at the French All Black game many years ago. Ouch. Hey, what a, what a neat morning we've had, eh? Um, isn't it a blessing to be part of a church where we have so much happening in our community? Um, listening to Steph and Caroline this morning and just the life that is happening in this church beyond these walls, you know? Like, isn't it exciting to know that we have an incredible number of young people who are hungry to know the Word of God and hungry to know what it means to, to walk and live as uh, children in the light? I just think it's beautiful. And thank you, Alina, for what you've shared this morning. It's <clears throat> so encouraging to hear uh, what's happening around the world and for those who are faithful, those who go and serve. Um, be a great encouragement and challenge for us as well. So thank you for that. This week I have yeah, been sitting... Oh, that's not even there. How do we do this, Josh? There we go. Isn't that a beautiful colour? <laughs> Makes me smile. Thanks, Grace. This week I've been sitting in this passage from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through to 2, 6, and... Uh, Probably the best word to use is just lingering on each verse. And I've just been, like, again, just blown away, captivated by the Word of God and how deep it is. And we can read this this morning at face value, and it says so much. Um, but what I've found as I've <clears throat> engaged in it and asked the Holy Spirit to reveal things to me as I've read commentaries and listened to messages and various things, there is just so much depth in each and every statement that John makes. And my hope and prayer this morning is, because there's, there's just no way we can cover it all, but is that there's things that just capture your attention today, things that grab your heart. And, uh, you know, we'd always hope that we'd go home and we'd test the things that we hear, but I pray that you go home and read this again and allow these things to linger in your heart. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a special visitor I don't know if you remember, John the Apostle came and visited us. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, Richard <coughs> tried to dress up, and uh, he did a wonderful job, Richard, even though you fell asleep on us. But what we learned in that message was just a little bit about the character John, the person who wrote this incredible letter. And I encourage you to go back and have a listen to that if you get a chance, and, uh, and, the, and the message before that as well. Just there's a lot of background to the reason as to why John writes this letter. But the kind of the key things, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably just going to skip over a few things this morning, but he's writing to a church. He's writing to believers. He's writing to people like you and I. He is writing to us. And there's some things that are happening at the time. You know, John is the last living disciple. He's the last living apostle, the last of those who walked with Jesus through his ministry so closely. He is the last one. And he is old in, in the last kind of years of his life, and he is desperate to get some of these important messages out. The other thing that's happening is that there is great persecution on the church, and so it's on John's heart to teach and to give messages that would protect the flock, protect the church, protect the believers of Christ so that they can stand firm in what comes their way. And we talked about these heresies, these people who are raised, coming up through the church and outside the church, teaching messages to, uh, to, to mislead or, or to um, basically deny the truth of Jesus. And they were, they were taking portions of the church out with their message. And so John is passionate about teaching truth. One of the heresies that he is combating is this idea that sin does not matter. And so this morning, just what we all want to hear on a Sunday morning, we're going to talk a lot about sin this morning. Because it's a big deal. And it's serious. And it's important that we understand it. So let's jump in. 1 John, 1, 5 to 2, 6. I'm going to need these, aren't I? This is the message we have heard from him, it's from Jesus, and declare to you, God is light, 
and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Incredible passage of scripture. When I was 11 years old, I left home. It's a strange age to leave home. I uh, went off to boarding school up in Auckland. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the name Dilworth. That's where I went to school. If you've got questions, you can talk to me later. I know some of you will. I was 11 years old, and earlier in my life, my parents became Christians. They met the Lord when I was about three years old. And I had some really powerful experiences as a young boy. I had absolute confidence, 100% confidence that God was real. So when I left home at 11 to go to boarding school, without a shadow of doubt, I knew that God was real. However, my life did not reflect somebody who had a relationship with Jesus. The knowledge was there, but my life didn't reflect that. Uh, I was 14 years old, and I came back to school after spending the weekend at home. I'd been to church and uh, got on the bus and headed back up to to, uh, boarding school. Sunday evening, I was sitting down with one of my good mates, Anil, And we're just chewing the fat, talking about our week. And I got to the bit about church, and he kind of stopped me and accusingly said, Chappie, are you a Christian? (laughs) And I said, yeah. And he just started laughing at me. (laughs) He said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean, no, I'm not? And he said, mate, you swear like a trooper. I've seen the pictures in your locker. This is what we did last week. How can you tell me that you're a Christian? And it was like someone picked up a cold, dead fish and slapped it across my face. It was a point in time that I look back on and realize it was so, so important. Someone turned the light on. That night, I got down on my knees in my dorm, and I gave my life back to Jesus. And uh, you know, the thing that really struck me was what Anil had shown in me that I was living a lie, that I could live one person over here and be another person over here. There was no authenticity in who I was. I just chop and change depending on where I was. And that night in my dorm, you know, I prayed some dangerous prayers, but my heart was, I never wanted to be this person where, again, where I could be a different person in different settings. I wanted to be consistent. I wanted to be authentic. And I wanted that authenticity to represent God. So skip forward a few years, we were in my last year at school, and uh, we're sitting around the table in a a graphics class, um, seventh form, having a a heated conversation. I can't remember the specific details, but uh, there was a a church minister that was in the media for some misconduct, the way he was treating uh, various people in, in their community. And the conversation was going on about how horrible the hypocrisy was in the church and I remember my friend Jake making a comment along the lines of how could somebody in their right mind follow somebody whose life does not reflect what they teach and he made this comment that will always stick with me he said if they walked what they talked I'd probably listen I took this to heart 
I um, from 14, I don't know, through the grace of God, uh, there were some changes in my life, some big changes. Um, I kind of, I was given the nickname at school, God Boy or God Squad. I had all sorts of nicknames, not things that I've carried on for obvious reasons, but I was well known for, um, <laughs> for being a Christian in the school and not always for the right reasons. But I felt this hit really personally for me when Jake said this comment. I was the only Christian in our school. And I knew that it mattered that what I said had to be reflected in what I walked. And it's challenged me my whole life. It still challenges me. And there's times where I look at my actions or the things I've done and I just feel so grieved that I've let God down. What John talks about this morning, or in this passage, is the need to be authentic. What does it mean to be authentic, to have authentic faith? This first part, he says, this is the message. This is the message which we have heard from Jesus and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, when we become Christians, God calls us out of the darkness and into the light. We become, as the word says, children of light. Now we could think of this word light as as truth. He calls us out of the darkness and into truth. I really like analogies. Uh, I don't know why. I just like telling stories, I guess. But the other night, (laughs) I was thinking about this idea of dark and light. And um, I don't know about you, but one of the worst things in the world to hear just after you've kind of lay down on your bed, the lights are off, you're just in that stage where you're about to go to sleep, and then you hear that Yeah, it's the worst thing in the world, eh? And I'm, I'm known for picking up pillows and throwing them across the room and doing all sorts of things, waking up the household and yelling and whatever. Inevitably, what happens is I get up and I turn on the light, and what it reveals is not only the fact that there's about 10 mozzies, not just one, because I left the window open, but also that there's pillows all over the room, I've knocked off the the mirror or whatever it might be, you know, there's carnage. What happens when we turn on the light? When light comes in, it reveals the truth. It reveals what is actually happening. In Ephesians 5, 8, 13, it says that when the light shines in on us, it reveals our true nature. Paul says, he says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our true nature, Paul also says that we are born sinful by nature. Now, when the light comes on in our lives, it reveals that we all have sin in our lives. When we first moved into our house, down the back of our section were three massive gum trees, and they were so big that they prevented any light from hitting the back of our section. And it was just it was just dirt. It was just dirt down there. And if you go down at night time and turn on the light, you see these little eyes and all these rats scurrying around. The only thing that lived there were this, was vermin, these filthy rats, big river rats. They were scary. We dropped those trees, and it didn't take light, long for life to come into that area of our, of our property. And if you go down there now, it's, you, you can hardly get through it with a lawnmower. It's just flourishing. It's full of life. No sign of any rats. There's a few pesky chickens sifting around. The other thing that light does is it brings life. Genesis 1 tells us that in the beginning, the world or the earth was empty. It was formless. There was darkness. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. It is the beginning. It is the foundation, the formation of all life. Light not only reveals darkness, but it allows life to grow. You know, the message that John is proclaiming here, the message of Jesus that John is talking about, he's saying that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. To hear this message is to recognize our desperate need for a savior, our desperate need to learn what it means to walk in the light. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we read this, we read two things that accompany the life that walks in the light. The first is when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, I really wrestled as to whether or not I'd share this story this morning, but I felt that it was necessary, and I'm just going to trust that there's good reason and that it means something to someone, but as a young, uh, as a teenager, as a young adult, I had some really big struggles in my life, and uh, one area in particular that I really wrestled with was in the area of lust and pornography. It really had a grip on my life, and uh, Skip forward a few years, I, when I was dating Melissa, and I realized that she was someone I'd like to spend the rest of my life with, I wrestled with this idea, do I tell her the stuff from my past? Do I allow her to see this dark part of my life? I could have easily hidden it from her and carried on, but I really felt that it was important that I had no secrets from this person I wanted to live with for the rest of my life. I wasn't afraid of telling her. What I was afraid of was her response. I was afraid that she would walk off and I'd never see her again. So when I told her, do you know what she said? The first thing she said was, I wasn't planning on getting emotional. Must be the South Africans, eh? Wayne Barnes is going to be in trouble tomorrow. I tell you what, <clears throat> I'm just leaving you in suspense, that's all. She said, my love for you has grown deeper. My trust, my confidence, you know, all these things. And what happened was our fellowship, our relationship from that day was stronger. You see, when we bring things into the light, it allows strength in our relationships. Ooh, that rugby game. It was actually quite a few years earlier where I had brought this before my pastor and my parents and people that I trust. You know what happens? When we bring the light in on sin in our lives, it loses its grip on us. It loses its power. And the other thing that it says in here is that when we walk in the light, when we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And I can say that I've been healed from that addiction. It has no hold on my life whatsoever, which is beautiful. Yeah. All right. There's a couple of problems with this verse. No problems like God doesn't make mistakes. Problems in our interpretation. So it says, in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. And there's places where we may hear interpretation or we may feel interpretation that if when we've asked Jesus into our life and he's cleansed us of all sin, does that mean that as we continue to live with him that we have to live a perfect life without sin? That's one way we could interpret it. Another way that can be interpreted, and this is what John's wrestling with, is that because Jesus has cleansed us of all sin, it means we don't, it doesn't matter. We can sin, we can do whatever we like because Jesus has cleansed us. There are some issues with understanding it. And, and if we read passages in isolation, this is the sort, of con, uh, the sort of conclusions we can make. But John's well aware of the fact that some people might understand it this way. And so he continues, and he gives us more in terms of understanding what it means to walk in the light. He says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So straight away, he's acknowledging that even as believers, we do have sin in our lives. So how do we find authentic faith where sin has no grip, has no hold on us? How do we become people where sin has no control in our lives? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He is faithful and and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The mark of an authentic Christian 
is not sinlessness. It's not being perfect. The mark of an authentic Christian is sin consciousness. What I mean by that is that when we walk in the light, we allow God to reveal sin in our lives, and our responsibility is to deal with it immediately. You know that beautiful line, I think it's David prays, search my heart, O God, and reveal any offensive way within me. It should be our prayer daily, because our desire should be to walk in the light as he is in the light. Denying sin in our lives, denying our sinfulness, it cuts us off from fellowship with God. But confessing our sin opens us up to forgiveness and cleansing. So, John's heart is that we would not sin, right? And that's probably all of us. We'd love to be people who do not sin. But the reality is we make mistakes all the time. And so our desire is to be people who are able to recognize that when it happens and bring it before God. And I love this next part. I love this passage. And John, this is chapter 2, he says... My little children, my dear children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. These things to help you in your sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. Man, I love this passage of scripture. John introduces to us a couple of titles for Jesus. Jesus, our advocate. Jesus, our propitiation. I've chosen to use this language this morning because I think it's, it's important. But I must be honest, how many of us know what the word propitiation means? That's really encouraging. No one. <laughs> That's why they translate it differently. The way that I've, this is a word that kind of hit me quite a few years ago, and it was when I was reading a, um, I was reading an article uh, probably put out by NASA or something, it was about um, rocket ships, spaceships, I don't even know the technical name, and they talked about this thing called a propitiatory shield, and immediately my mind went, oh, I remember that word from the Bible, and I have no idea what it means, let's keep reading. And so, when they, when you would have seen pictures or, f- or videos or photos, whatever, of, of like space rockets coming through Earth's atmosphere and like a ball of fire around the front of it. Is that a familiar picture? Or if you haven't, there's one there. Um, so when something travels through the Earth's atmosphere, there's incredible heat, pressure, friction. I should probably have you up here speaking. Hey, Keith, you'd know more about this than me. But the thing is, there is immense heat and pressure. And what this article was talking about was how they wrestled with the idea of how do we send something through the Earth's atmosphere and protect the things that are within that spacecraft? How do we send something through so the spacecraft doesn't just get burnt up and melt to pieces? And so they designed this heat shield called a propitiatory shield. And the purpose of that shield is that as it goes through, as the friction, as the heat, as the fire comes on, it diverts it away from that which is behind it, protecting whatever's inside that spaceship and protecting the spaceship itself. So when we think about this image as Jesus being our propitiation, this is the image. Now, if the Bible is true and God is light and there is nothing, no darkness within him at all, if he is holy, if he is just, if the Bible is right in saying that we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God, then what we deserve, we know the wages of sin are death. What we deserve from a justice God or a just God is to be punished. The full fire of God to rain down upon our sin. But Jesus, when we ask him into our life, stands as our propitiation and takes that heat on our behalf and shields us. The other title that John gives us is that Jesus is our advocate. He's our comforter, the one who comes alongside us, who stands at our defense. You know, those struggles that I had as a young man, I had someone in my ear. I had an accuser. 
Satan, his name means the accuser. And he'd feed me lies like, you're not good enough to have a relationship with this person. You're not good enough to stand before God. You're going to be a failure. You're going to be dirty. You're going to be this mess your whole life. And when I brought that into the light, you know, Satan was wiped out because I had a defender. I had an advocate, someone standing on my side, defending my case before God. Jesus, our advocate, the word that's used here is the same word that Jesus uses when he talks about how there'll be one who comes, the one who comes, the Holy Spirit. And the word that's used is is parakletos. Um, Again, I, I don't know, I read weird articles, but I remember reading something when I was younger and it was about a hunting party, and I can't remember the, the um, whereabouts in the world it was, but this hunting party, it was a, a, a tribe somewhere where they hadn't developed technology or haven't engaged with things of the West, so to speak. So, so they'd go out in these hunting parties, hunting game for the village. And as they'd go out, they'd take um, their weapons, their tools, whatever, but they'd take these two big poles, which when they killed maybe it was a bear, they'd throw it up on this pole and they'd run, I can't remember why, but they'd run back to their village with this, with this bear. And there was one person in the hunting party and his name was the paraclete. That was his role, was to be the paraclete. And his role was not to take weapons, wasn't to fight, wasn't to hunt. His role, his whole purpose was to run alongside these men that if one of them was to trip or to stumble or to grow weak, It wasn't to replace him, but it was to come alongside him and help him so that they could complete that task together. This idea of an advocate, it literally literally translates as one called alongside. And so when we talk about Jesus as being our advocate, he's not somewhere far away trying to defend us. He is alongside us, walking alongside us, giving us strength, giving us comfort, and defending us. It's a really cool picture, eh? really cool picture. So when John says that when you do sin, (laughs) or if you sin, we have Jesus, who is our propitiation. He is our advocate. The message, God is light, in him is no darkness at all. Do you know what Jesus calls himself? He calls himself the light of the world. The light of the world. Not only this, John then goes on and talks about how we can conquer sin, how we can have victory over it. The way that we have victory over this is by walking in the light as he is in the light. And he gives us three things. The first one we've talked about, confess our sins. If we confess our sins, we can have victory over sin. The second, he says this. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commands, uh, does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. This is called to be obedient, to obey the word of God. Um, I love that, that uh, memory verse that Steph and Carolyn mentioned this morning. Uh, was it Psalm 119 that, that, I think I put it up there, did I? Look at that. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need to be daily in the word. Daily in the word. Seeking for truth. Discovering God's will for our lives. Yeah, Jesus says that if you love me, you'll obey my commands. It's funny, like we can think about this and I I don't know, as a father, I have rules in my home and I don't put those down because I want to be mean and make sure my kids have a horrible kind of life doing the things that I tell them. I give them rules because I love them and I want them to flourish. I want them to grow. I want them to be the best people that they can be. When we learn to read the Bible and find it, as a source for our need, for our help. It's not there to, to tell us off. It's there to help us to grow. It's there to help us to become more like Christ, 
to be the best people, to be the people that God created us to be. So when we have struggles in our marriage, where do we turn to? The Bible. When we have struggles as a parent, when we're in dark places in our lives, when we've got questions, we don't know where to go, this is where we go. We learn to be obedient and trust the word of God. Hmm. We're all good, eh? Sam, Sam sent through um, some updates this week. It's so good to hear from her. And she sent a little video. Um, I'm not sure how many of you got to see it. But she made this comment, something that's been really challenging her um, in her trip. And uh, she'd heard someone say these, these words. And I, I wrote them down because I thought they, they really struck a chord. She said, of this person who said this, the easiest way to let our hearts grow cold is to walk out of the church or any place of fellowship after hearing the word and doing nothing about it, not letting it have any influence in our lives. The easiest way to let our hearts grow cold is to walk out of any place where we've heard the word of God and not allow it to have effect in our lives. Light brings truth. Light brings life. Jesus is the light of the world, and we are called to walk in the light as he is in the light. The third thing that John gives us, to walk in the light means to abide in Christ. He says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. How do we live in Christ? (laughs) We confess our sins and we live obediently. We study the scriptures about his life, the way he responded to situations and we seek him. And you know one of the things that I love the most about this Christian life is that we're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit who can guide us, who can lead us, who can teach us and draw us into deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. What a blessing. Jesus said this in John 8, 29. He said, I always do what pleases him. And he's talking about God, his Father. I always do what pleases God the Father. Can we say the same of our own lives? We've spent time this year in Amos and Malachi, and and the message that we've heard quite a lot is that God is calling Israel to repent, to turn, to lift their eyes and their hearts back to God. He's calling us to do the same. You know, what are the priorities in our life? What are the things that we hold most dear? Is obeying God, living in the light, confessing our sins, are these things up there on the top of our list? If we are to be authentic in our fellowship and our relationship with each other, with God, if we are to be authentic in our faith, we need to learn what it means to walk in the light. I think the most beautiful thing is that God has given us everything we need to do it. He has given us a beautiful, beautiful story and truth in Jesus Christ. Hmm. The reality is that if we want to walk in the light, as he is in the light, it's impossible without Jesus Christ. Because the only way that we can walk in the light, the only way that we can be in the presence of God, is if we have Jesus, our propitiation, Jesus, our advocate, Jesus, our saviour, Jesus, the light of the world. And so this morning... So I encourage you, you know, like we have this beautiful truth. I think of my backyard, you know, when we drop those trees and the life that has come in there, the flowers, the trees, the fact that we can actually put animals down there and they thrive. Just this image of the power of light. And when we allow Jesus Christ to shine in our lives, the opportunity for life. Hmm. So this morning, because you're all itching to go watch the game, um, (laughs) I'd encourage you this morning, we've got people who love praying. I love praying for people. And we have an awesome God who loves listening to prayers, right? And answering prayers and doing work in our lives. If you're struggling, if you, like 14-year-old Tom, realize that there's aspects of your life where 
you're this person here and you're this person here and there's a lack of authenticity across the board. I encourage you today to confess that to God. You don't have to stand up here and tell the whole world what's going on in your life, but you do need to tell God. So I encourage you to come up and bring that before the Lord. Surrender your life to Him again. And we'd love to pray, pray for you. You know, if there are things in your life, if there's sin in your life that you know needs to come into the light so that God can break the power of sin, can break the hold that it has over you, I encourage you to come up. It is beautiful to be free of the things that feed lies to us. Remember, Satan is an accuser, and he will feed you lies all day long to hold you in that place. If you'd like to be free of that, please come so we can pray. If you struggle with being obedient, if you struggle with reading the word and understanding it, maybe it's a genuine thing that you're trying, but it's just like, God, you just don't speak to me. If you'd like help on that, please talk to us. And I'd love to pray and ask the Holy Spirit. It talks about the Holy Spirit being our teacher. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight and wisdom and the ability to understand. Hmm. My mum, when she became a Christian, we lived miles away. Uh, she wasn't well educated, but she wanted to understand the Bible. And so she read that the Holy Spirit was our teacher. And she asked the Holy Spirit to teach her the scriptures. She is probably one of the most well-read people I know. I ring her up when I'm writing a sermon and say, Mom, I'm stuck on this verse, and she'll send me to about 50 other ones. I'm like, how do you know this? And she's like, the Holy Spirit. I'm like, fantastic. If you'd like to be able to read the Bible and understand it, let us pray for you. Um, yeah, and if there's anything else in your life whatsoever, you know, we have this amazing gift to be able to pray for each other, right? Eh? We have a God who is not far away. He is right here. Why would we walk out the door if we've got stuff in our life?